This video is for entertainment and educational purposes only. It contains mature subject matter, and viewer discretion is advised. In June of 1996, in the town of Novokuznetsk in Siberia, Russia, body parts of children washed up on shore at the river Abba. Dismembered bodies, arms, legs, torsos, and even severed heads. What was going on? Was this the act of organ harvesters, or was there a serial killer on the loose? Hi, my name is Anya. Welcome to my channel and thank you for being here. Tonight we are traveling all the way to Russia and we are talking about Alexander Spetsivis, a freaking lunatic. I will insert translated interrogation footage in the video as we go. Also note that many of the victims were never identified. This is a creepy one, so buckle up. Okay, let's go. Alexander Spesitsev was born in Siberia in an industrial town in March of 1970. He was born into a violent home life. His father was an alcoholic and would often abuse him and his mother, Ludmilla. Alexander also had an older sister that we know little about. Ludmilla worked as a teacher's assistant at a school nearby, and Alexander's father was a steelworker but lost his job when Alexander was a toddler. And one night when Alexander was five years old, his father beat his mother severely. He then left the apartment never to return home. This is when everything would change, and Alexander's violent and cruel destiny was forged. His mother would leech onto him, and she treated him like he was her husband. They shared a bed in more ways than one, and at some point, they started a sexual relationship. As a child, Alexander was small. He was underweight and often sick. He was a lonely child and was bullied. Ludmilla was overbearing and poured all her attention onto Alexander. She was unrelenting, and him, being a child, didn't know any better. He always looked for her approval, and even though she didn't beat him, he feared her. Alexander never wanted to upset her, and she would reward his good behavior with sex. When Alexander was 12 years old, Ludmilla got caught stealing from the school and was fired from her job. However, she quickly found a new job at the prosecutor's office working for a blind lawyer. She now had access to police files and crime scene photos. She started bringing home the files and showing the gruesome photos to Alexander. The pictures were of murdered people and dismembered bodies, and he was fascinated. Instead of storybooks, Alexander only read criminal case files. Soon, he started to feel sexual arousal at the thought of the disturbing images. One day, one of his classmates noticed one of the photos in between Alexander's schoolbook and said that mothers shouldn't show their children such images. Alexander lost it and attacked the boy. After this, he became more violent, and everyone in school avoided him, as did his neighbors. He became obsessed with the images and would look at them for hours on end, with his mother next to him. Although being an outsider, Alexander managed to meet a girl in 1988 at the age of 17, the girl was 16 and her name was Eugenia. They seemed to have a normal relationship. He would actually court her, buy her flowers, and write her poetry. Even Ludmilla seemed okay with the blossoming relationship, but of course that wouldn't last. At this point, his sister had moved out, and Ludmilla again poured all her attention and her focus on Alexander, and started to get jealous of the young couple. She talked bad about his girlfriend, and one day, Eugenia had enough. When they were alone in the apartment, Eugenia said something not very nice about Ludmilla, and Alexander attacked her. He hit her, and she tried to escape. Alexander grabbed her, hitting her in the face, and then dragging her into the bedroom. At this point, his mother came home, saw what was going on, and did nothing. Alexander tied Eugenia to the bed and kept her there for about four weeks. He brutalized her and raped her repeatedly. Her parents reported her missing the same day she didn't come home, but the police did nothing. This could be because one of the police officers knew Ludmilla from her job. The parents went to the apartment, but no one opened the door, even though they could hear people moving around inside. After four weeks, the parents went back to the police and put pressure on them, and this time, police raided the apartment. They found Eugenia tied to the bed, bruised, beaten, and shockingly, she had been stabbed multiple times. Alexander was arrested, however, Ludmilla lied and said she had no idea what was going on and that she hadn't been home a lot. Eugenia was taken to hospital but died of her injuries only a few days later. 
She was covered in so many infected wounds and injuries that the doctors didn't really know the cause of death. The official reason was sepsis. Alexander was not criminally prosecuted, but taken into a mental hospital and was given a diagnosis of schizophrenia and a slew of other illnesses. Only two years after killing Eugenia, he was released back into Ludmilla's care, as he no longer posted a threat to society, well according to the doctors. The reason for the release could have been many, like lack of resources or an oversight by the hospital. As you can tell, this isn't going to end well. The dude killed his girlfriend, and brutally so, and was out in two years. Even worse, he went back to his crazy mother. There were rumors that Ludmilla bribed someone at the facility that she knew through her job. Understand, it was a very poor and corrupt time in Russia. Bribes were nothing new or unusual. On top of him being released, there was no paper trail of him or his stay at the facility, and that's going to come into play later on. If you thought that was bad, and even though a young woman was beaten to death, this is where the true nightmare begins for many, many victims as young as three years old. Now that he was home, he told his mother of something he'd done in the hospital. He had inserted a metal rod into his penis in the hope that would give him sexual pleasure, but instead it caused him immense pain, erectile dysfunction, and severe genital inflammation. This angered him and he grew resentful. You wake up in pain and fall asleep in pain. Then when someone talks to you about this topic or reminds you, I just hate it. I just hate these people. His mother promised him that from now on she would oversee his sex life. He got a tattoo of the letter E on his ring finger. When asked about it, he responded that it was in the memory of his wife. The mother and son got themselves a pet, a big Newfoundland dog, and that is foreshadowing. Alexander and his mother kept on bonding over things like deep hatred for capitalism and democracy. They had developed an intense hatred for homeless children, which had become commonplace since the collapse of the Soviet Union, and these children became his main target. Ludmilla said these children would be the perfect sexual partners for her son, since no one would come looking for them. Many of the street kids came from dysfunctional backgrounds. They came from violent homes where alcohol was abused. In April of 1996, Alexander met four homeless boys and tricked them into his apartment, saying he was going to burgle the place and that he had a key to get in. When they got into his apartment, he threatened the boys. When one of them tried to flee, Alexander stabbed him with a huge kitchen knife. When the other children tried to help their friend, he went berserk and stabbed them multiple times in a frenzy killing them. After the killings, he had sex with the corpses. After a few days, he lured two homeless girls aged 12 and 14 to his home promising them money to work for his new business. When they got there, the girls saw the four dead boys decomposing bodies in the living room. The girls panicked and tried to run, but he stabbed the girls using the same weapon. Him and his mother chopped up the bodies of all six children, and Ludmilla dumped some of the body parts in the River Abba near their housing block, and the rest she discarded at a waste dump. You might wonder why the neighbors didn't intervene when they smelled the rot and heard the rockets and screams. Well, they thought it was Alexander making all that noise since they knew he was severely mentally ill. He would also play loud music as he tortured and raped his victims. In June of that same year, body parts like severed limbs and heads started to wash up at the riverbank. It was thought that it was the body parts of victims of organ harvesters. But at a closer look, Authorities noticed that the organs were still intact. However, the victims were homeless children, so catching the killer wasn't a priority. In June, he managed to kill four more victims, two teenage girls, one woman in her 40s, and a man in his 30s. They were also dismembered and dumped in the river and were never identified. Somewhere in this mess, he had a sexual encounter with a woman, but killed her when she insulted him. There was a sexual act between us, and at the end when we were talking, there was a sharp tone in her voice, and she insulted me. I couldn't stand it, so I took a knife and stabbed her in the chest. In July, a girl called Natalia was killed, and two 12-year-old girls disappeared. Their parents reported the crime, but were told by police that the girls probably just ran away. Towns across Russia were really struggling with poverty. 
Factories and steel plants were closing down, and people sold what they could, stolen or otherwise. Ludmilla had continued stealing and selling stolen goods all this time, but police were cracking down on racketeering, and it became harder to sell stolen goods. The mother and son duo couldn't afford food for them or their ferocious dog. They started feeding the dog the victim's remains, and soon they themselves cooked and ate their victims. Yes, mother and son, human beings, cooked and ate their victims. More than 70 body parts had now been found in the river and at waste dumps, and forensics discovered that there were victims as young as three years old among the gruesome findings. And with so many people reported missing, the authorities now took the vanishings seriously. They understood that there was a maniac killer on the loose. A manhunt began. The police deployed hundreds of officers and soldiers to find the murderer. Yes, they were looking for one man, never even imagining that there could be a woman involved, let alone the killer's own mother. Detectives targeted known criminals in the area, but Alexander was not one of them. There was no paper trail of Alexander or the murder of Eugenia. Detectives focused on finding Oleg Rilkov, a murderer and child rapist that had been on the run. Let's talk about Oleg Rilkov, a heinous creature, and just as bad, demented, and maniacal as Alexander. Rilkov had committed a series of rapes on girls aged between 6 and 13. Taking advantage of the lack of adults, he broke into the victims' apartments, raped them, and then burgled the apartment. On February 7, 1996, Rilkov committed the first murder, killing seven-year-old Ruslan. He easily convinced the boy to come with him and then brutally killed him in the village of Tolyati, inflicting several dozen stab wounds. He then cut off the boy's genitals, ears, tongue, and eyes. Subsequently, when the corpse was discovered, the experts could not determine immediately the sex of the victim due to the heavy mutilation. He continued his rampage and committed several dozen rapes, two of which ended in brutal murders. In one of these attacks, he broke into an apartment where an underage boy and his sister were home alone. The brother miraculously managed to escape, but Rilkov killed his sister with an axe. On July 20th of 1996, Rilkov killed another girl. The mutilated body was found in an abandoned bunker on the territory of a military unit, this time, there were witnesses who claimed to have seen Rilkov with the girl, and a facial composite was soon created. By the evening, the man was identified as Rilkov. Rilkov was found and arrested. He was taken to some of the crime sites where he'd committed some of his vile acts. I raped her, Polina. I pushed her on the bed so that she was face down. I had an axe in my hand. I hit her on the back of her head with the blunt part of the axe. Many times somewhere between four and five times. She wheezed and then went quiet. And then I went outside and picked some berries. Well, I tried to rape her, but in short, I didn't do it. Well, I, um, I mocked her. Well, before that, I hit the boy with an axe. It sounds blasphemous, but something, how can I put it, a higher pleasure or something. After the first murder, something inside me pushed me to continue. Authorities were content and sure they had found their man. And although it was a good thing that Rilkov was caught, the real killer was still out there. Alexander and Ludmila were delighted about the arrest, and they continued with the gruesome murders. He began to target older victims that he met in bars and nightclubs. He chained his victims to radiators, beat them, tortured, raped them, killed them, and ate them. The same rinse and repeat, he also had sex with the corpses. The mother and son became more sadistic and put their victims to something one couldn't imagine in their worst nightmares. If they lured home a group of children, they would torment them by killing a friend in front of them and then making the children eat parts of their friend. Apparently, as all of this was going on, the sister visited them, but either didn't know what was going on or simply didn't care. In February of 1997, a girl named Olga and her two friends Nastya and Zenya visited a shop near Alexander's housing block, and outside Ludmilla approached the three girls. She asked the girls to carry her heavy grocery bags home, and the girls sweetly did so. Inside the apartment, Alexander and his vicious dog trapped the girls in the living room, threatening them. 
Nastia tried to flee. The madman attacked her and strangled her with a rope. I hit her a few times, below the heart near the stomach and in the throat. But she lived so I strangled her with a rope. He tied down the other two girls. The parents were begging for the police to find their missing children. Again, officers said that the girls had probably ran off with some boys. The police did not launch an investigation. Alexander gave the two girls hacksaws and told them to dismember their dead friend's body, and the girls did as they were told. He also instructed them to cut off chunks of meat of the body so that he could fry the meat in a pan and eat it. He and Ludmilla ate the fried meat in front of the terrified girls. They also told the girls to eat, and when Zenya refused, Ludmilla stabbed the girl, not killing her, but scaring her enough that she ate what was offered. Then the girls were tied to a radiator. They let the dog lap the girl's bleeding wounds, and she could do nothing. In the evening, there was till Nastya's meat in the pot. My mother said she couldn't carry it, so she told me to give it to the girls. I took the meat to the bedroom and gave it to the girls. Later that evening, Alexander cut slices of flesh off the girl whilst she was still alive, feeding the pieces to the dog. And then he made the girl do the same, feed pieces of her own flesh to the dog. Yes, the dog ate the spine. Just ate all the vertebrae? Well, yes, the dog eats ribs very quickly. Alexander kept on beating the girls, stabbing and raping them in front of each other. He also took pictures of them when they were naked. He beat one of the girls so badly that to keep her alive, Ludmilla sewed her skin together with a needle and thread. Ludmilla just sat and watched and never spoke to the victims. More body parts of children washed up on the riverbank, but police still refused to launch an investigation. Finally, Alexander killed Zenya. He overheard the girls talking about how they would escape, and he flew into a fit of rage and beat Zenya to death. After that, I got angry and began beating Zenya. Did you do something with the body? Yes, they cut her up, mother and Olga. They made Olga cut up her friend's body. Now she was the only one alive. When she refused to eat parts of her friend, he stabbed her yet again, but not fatally. She already knew she was going to die, so what was the point? During one of the attacks on Olga, someone knocked on the door. It was an emergency plumber that wanted to enter the home due to the horrendous stench that was now affecting the whole building. Olga heard the knock and tried to scream, but Alexander just got angrier. He told the plumber that he couldn't come in. The plumber had a strange feeling that something was going on in the apartment when he heard Olga's muffled cries for help and the dog's loud barking. The man then looked through the letterbox and could see the barking hound, and he could now tell that the smell was coming from inside the apartment. He again heard a cry for help, but also heard something slam. This was the sound of Alexander fleeing through a window. When the plumber, for the second time, looked through the letterbox, he could see blood-stained walls. He could also tell the dog's face was covered in blood. And that's when he called the police from a public phone. The police kicked in the door and shot the dog. They heard sounds from the kitchen, and on the stove, they found pots with boiling water. But at a closer look, they saw that something was being cooked. It was fingers and a human head. In the bathroom, they found a child's headless torso in the tub. Finally, the police found Olga in the living room, where she was lying on a plastic-covered sofa passed out. She was rushed to the hospital. She told the police as good as she could about the horrors that took place in the apartment. Olga, who brought you to the apartment? Old woman, grandmother. Under what circumstances did she bring you to the apartment? She couldn't open the door? She couldn't open the door, could she? And she asked you to help. Yes. Here is a photo. Who is this? It's me. Did he take the pictures? Yes. When did he take the pictures? On the second day. Were all three of you still alive? No, Nastya was already killed, and we saw it. Nastya was already dead? You said he gave Nastya's body to his mother to throw in the soup. She didn't put it in the soup. She cooked it separately. 
For whom did she cook it for? For us, but she... But his mother cooked it right? The grandmother? By the way, I hate this investigator. The way he talks to her, the tone of his voice, and he keeps interrupting her. He is so cold, uncaring, and inconsiderate. She's been raped. She's been beaten half to death. She's been forced to eat her friends, saw her friends into bits. And you have this cold man interviewing her? Fucking kidding me. Unfortunately, Olga died of her injuries, not even 20 hours after being committed to the hospital. Meanwhile, back at the apartment, Ludmilla, now 60 years old, was arrested. But she claimed she had not participated in the torture and murder of innocent people, but admitted to helping her son get rid of the bodies. Her excuse was that she was afraid of him and what he would do to her. For some reason, Ludmilla and Alexander were allowed in the same interrogation room, where they argued about four buckets of disposed body parts, and whether or not Ludmilla had not only discarded the victims, but also participated in eating them. I don't know of any corpses. I saw four buckets in the bathroom, but I didn't hide anything. I was not drunk. I remember everything well. There were buckets. I saw them. I don't know anything more. You are shameless. But I'm not angry. Then why are you so aggressive with me? Because they are asking me about the dead bodies. You carved corpses. And I didn't touch your dead bodies. I didn't eat them. And you said I ate cutlets. You are shameless. Police found many disturbing and sickening things at the apartment. Polaroids of naked and tortured children, some chained to a radiator. Police also found more than 80 sets of blood-stained clothes. The blood didn't belong to Ludmilla or Alexander. They also discovered a lot of jewelry and other stolen goods, and disturbingly tiny little dirty shoes clearly belonging to very small children. The police found Alexander's diary, where he documented the murder of 19 people. These were the 19 killings that were held against him later on in court. Alexander couldn't make it on his own without his mother or the comfort of his home. He was hungry, and after a few days he found yet another victim, a woman, he attacked her, forcing her to the apartment. As he was going to rape and murder her, also probably eat her, the police stopped him. He told the police who he was and of course was placed under arrest. During the interrogation, he admitted to the murder of 19 people and alluded that there were more victims. He also admitted to eating his victims and told that his mother had participated in the gruesome act. The press nicknamed him the Cannibal of Siberia, and homeless children told the police of their encounters with the cannibal. In spring of 1997, at his first court appearance, he admitted to the 19 murders. Knowing he might face life in prison, he refused to take responsibility for all the murders. And although he had initially confessed, he later recanted. Unfortunately, the evidence in his apartment could only link him to four victims. Shockingly, he was only convicted of four murders. But it is believed that he was responsible for at least 80 murders. Ludmila was found guilty of being her son's accomplice and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. She was released in 2008 after having served only 13 years. She lives with her daughter in a rural village near the city of Osiniki. Alexander was evaluated and found to be insane. He was sent to Kamishan Regional Hospital, a high-security psychiatric facility in Volgograd, where he remains still to this day. He avoided prison yet again. And let me tell you, the prisons in Russia are no joke. He should have been sent to the Black Dolphin. But no, Alexander is now doing more than well. His mom and sister are free and living as if nothing ever happened. I'm really baffled it went down like this in Russia. The thing that somehow mental illness is a mitigating factor in punishing lunatics. Lunatics, barbarians, it irks me to my core. If you murder someone in my family and then you get sent to a clinic where you most likely won't get any prison justice, we have a problem. I know, I know, 
that in countries like Finland and Sweden, they coddle their violent criminals and treat them like little babies. But Russia, really? I hope his mother and sister rot and have awful lives. But again, they seem to be doing just fine. Okay, that's all and enough for tonight. Please lock your doors and stay safe. Thank you for watching, take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye!